Uh, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Oh, hi, Anita. Um, all these people that I know. How nice of you to all come out for me and for this. Uh, so this is part of the World War I series, and uh, this has been a couple of years in the making. We've been trying to do it, and I've been a little busy, and things have, you know, life happens and things like that. So, um, so we've finally been able to kind of get this together. Um, as we're waiting for the PowerPoint to start to do something uh, magical, that Paula, that Paula will do. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about how this, how this, uh, how this part of it came about. Um, I teach at SMSU in the theater program, and we have a uh, um, a program at SMSU f called the Faculty Improvement Grant, and you can write it for different. You can write it to go to. Oh hi, Brad. You can write it to go to um, conferences, and you can write it to do projects and things like that. And so I knew that this was coming up, and so I wrote a grant to purchase patterns and fabric for this particular event. And so um, after the Tempest was done, about two weeks ago, I started building the dresses, and um, they're almost done, which is great, uh, <laughs> seeing as this is, this is right now. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, because this is the one that's not finished. And I was going to try to finish it, but uh, I put it together the way the pattern tells you to put it together. And I thought, I'm just going to leave it, so we can talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Um, so on either side of the dress forms uh, and the mannequins on the tables, uh, the, the longer tables, these two and then, uh, or that one, those two down there, and then these two down here are actually from the 1920s. And so what you see in front of you from uh, this blue pinstripe onto this, uh, this brown polyester is actually the transition that fashion takes throughout World War I. And, um, and when the PowerPoint comes up, I'm going to start actually in 1912 and give you an idea of eight years later, we actually end up at the dawn of the, of the flapper era in 1920, which is a phenomenal change. And if you think about how uh, fashion changes, and we think that things change really fast and things like that, but if you think about men's suits, they've been the same since about 1800. So um, maybe we're not as progressive as we like to think that we are. And there are slight changes that happen throughout these um, eight or so years between 1912 and 1920. Um, Paula, do you have the PowerPoint ready? Okay. I'm not an actor, so and I'm not a singer, so you don't want me to do any of those things. Uh, so I guess we'll just start, I'm going to start with this one down here. Uh, this is where, uh, where we start in, in, the, uh, in the dialogue about the war. This is from 1914. And so what I did with the project is I ordered all of these patterns from a company called Pass Patterns. And what she does is she takes the actual patterns from the era and she makes the new pattern pieces from them and they fit more contemporary sized women, okay? And so, um, so I, that's what all of these patterns are from except the corset pattern was from another company. So all of the pattern pieces were original to the pattern of the time and all of the directions as well. When, uh, when I got the, the box of patterns, it says in almost every pattern, this is how it was, nothing has been changed. I got that, right? So that these are a little scant on, uh, on directions. And so um, I also brought with me a couple of contemporary period patterns so you can kind of see the difference. If you sew at all, uh, you'll be appreciative that people have these instead of these, okay? Um, I do a lot of stuff, uh, you know, at SMSU in the theater program, I do, I, I drape a lot of things, um, and I, I've been making a lot of things from patterns because we have to make things so quickly, or we have to make, you know, 14, 15, you know, characters' costumes at a time, and I can't make them in two weeks by myself, or with, you know, minimal sewing help from, from the students. So those are really wonderful. Otherwise, we can drape them, but they take a while. So these are the patterns that we got and they came in a giant sheet, and then I had to cut them all out. But they're only one size, unlike patterns today. Like this pattern is a, I can get my, through my glasses, uh, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. And then you cut the tissue paper to the size that you need, or you cut it so you can use it again in different sizes or whatever. This is a one size deal. So this pattern is a, a 44 bust and a 32 waist which isn't too bad. But when we get down here, some of these uh, are a 24 inch waist. Um, one of them, this, not, not this one, uh, 
This one is, she's too small. The mannequin is actually too big for this dress, uh, the, for the, the top. It's too tight on her. That's why it's not buttoned on the top, um, because they were really tiny. Some of them were really tiny. This is a rather large pattern. And, uh, and so when, we, when I got it and I cut the pieces out, the information that I got was so difficult to understand. And not just kind of the way they spelled things. I mean, we spell pleat, P-L-E-A-T. Well, they're all spelled P-L-A-I-T. I was Wikipediaing things like crazy because I'm like, I don't know what this means. I don't know what that is. Um, we don't wear a lot of gorgettes anymore, you know, which is like a fake collar that goes in the front. I didn't know what that was. Um, I mean, I know what it is historically, but I'm like, why would I make one now? And so, um, so I put it together as it told me to put it together. There is no interfacing in anything. So interfacing, for those of you who don't, so interfacing is the stuff that makes your collar stiff or makes your, flat, your fronts really flat, yeah, very starched kind of thing. There, there doesn't call for any of that. And so none of the collars, are, none of the cuffs have interfacing, nothing. Um, it also doesn't tell you how to finish any seams, and it doesn't tell you to hem anything, um, except the skirts did, and, all, and the, the skirts and this dress have a four-inch hem in them. Four inches, that's a lot. Right, so this is a four inch hem in here, which is this much. That's a gigantic hem, yeah. Um, and of course, you know, the costume person to me says, they're gonna see that line, I can't have that line there, but that's what it called for. So with this garment, what I did is um, I, uh, I shopped all this fabric in, uh, in Haywarden, Iowa, at Inweave, and trying to find the stuff that I, could, uh, that I could utilize. And on the patterns that they sent me, they had suggested, suggested fabrics. And so I tried to get as close as to what they suggested, you know, whether it be the, the print on it or whether it be the kind of fabric. And you can see that there's a lot of cottons that uh, were worn that, that I used up here. <clears throat> and so when I put this together, there's top stitching up here, meaning that these have come together and I've stitched down. And then this is supposed to come in. I do not understand how this goes together at all. Um, and so uh, the tunic dress was really popular, and I'll talk a little bit about that. that. But then there's, there's this piece that comes across here, and then it's just, that's all it is. There's, like, there's no closures in there. I don't, I'm not sure. It's like magic. This dress is supposed to stay up, I guess, right? It doesn't tell you to put buttons on. Um, it doesn't have buttons in, this, in the uh, notions that you need. It doesn't say anything about all that stuff. And so it was, it's really difficult to put things together. And they give you lots of choices. You can pleat things or you can gather things. Can you tell me what I should? I would like to know what I should do. Don't give me an option like that. And then, um, and so it was, it was a little challenging to kind of try to get this all together. And so I wanted to leave this for you um, and so you could kind of see how it goes. And of course, this has to be finished. It also says to put this piece on here, this front piece, and then to slit it. In my head, I'm thinking, couldn't you just make them two pieces? Because now I have to slit this nice fabric and it's all icky and I don't <laughs> like, you know, my head doesn't like that. Um, and then, of course, it doesn't tell you to hem it either. But this is what it, this is what it looks like. And then this, this collar up here, there's no interfacing. But on the design of it, it's very clear that it's supposed to stand up. They would have to have starched it, yeah. But we don't know that. We're just, you know, and I mean, there's a, yeah, you have to assume that, right. And of course, you know, we're, we're at the time period now where a lot of women know how to sew, it's not like, I mean, we have a lot of students who don't, they don't know how to sew anymore, so to pick something up like this, is, there's got to be some learning that goes on before that. Um, also, we're at the beginning of being able to buy things like printed patterns, so they're trying to figure out all of that stuff too. So it, it, is, it is a little challenging, but um, if you want to come up, you can take a look at all of this stuff, that would be, that would be great. Um, looks like our PowerPoint is up, so how do I... I have to tell you when to do it. Um, that's not the first slide. <laughs> Neither is that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can just go back to the other slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Inside, that's the title. We're in 1912. Two years before the war starts. So, again, I just want to put it in a little bit of time perspective for you. So in 1912, two years before the war starts, uh, we have a couple of significant events, one of which is the Titanic sinks, and then Amundsen and Scott race to the South Pole. Amundsen was Norwegian, um, and Scott was British, and they, uh, they raced to the, the, the South Pole in 1912, and so we've got a lot of major events going on. Um, when I was starting to do the research on this, you know, if you think about what 
the Titan film Titanic looks like. And then you think about the flapper area, we only have the span basically of the Great War in between those two fashions, fa fashion senses, which I think is really amazing. And you can see that with the dresses that we have uh, in the pictures here, we have a high waist, a little bit higher than normal waist. We have the very, these very long kind of slender gowns. We're not talking about that big Victorian era um, when we think about you know, big sleeves and hoop skirts. We're, we're done with all of that. That's not happening anymore. Um, this is known as the Edwardian era. This whole time is known as the Edwardian era. King Edward's already dead, but we're going to name it after him anyways. Um, and so uh, just to kind of give you a snapshot of what, of what this looks like. Um, all of these garments up here, and this is called Inside Out because I do have some undergarments that uh, I've, I've made as well, and we'll kind of go through them as we look at the different fashions here. But all of them would have a corset that's similar to this one here. And so <clears throat> you can see that um, we've had a lot of discussion about the course. You know, the corsets always tend to have pe get people talking. But this is, um, this is a corset typical to the era. And so it's got a busk in the front, and it has uh, the suspenders. Um, there are six suspenders around uh, to hold up the stockings. And then in the back, this is a little bit big for her, in the back is lacing that goes up the back, okay? Um, and so it's very different. It, you know, we're not thinking about the Civil War era where, you know, she's trying to get her waist to an 18-inch waist and all that kind of crazy stuff. We're not doing that thing anymore. It also sits just below the bust, and so we have this kind of uh, blousing effect that goes over the bust. It is slimming, but it's really just kind of, it, it is also to make the garments look better because they're so kind of like a column almost. Uh, again, all those hoops and crenlins and things like that are gone. When we are, during World War I, we do have something called the hoop crenoline, which is a shorter crenoline, and it almost looks like uh, the crenolines that we wore in the 1950s under, under poodle skirts, something kind of like that. But again, a little bit shorter. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, can, can like can cans. Yeah. Um, in 1914, when the war starts, we don't enter the war until 1917, but when the war starts in 1914, we have a lot of significant fashion elements happening. And you might recognize these two prints up here. They are done, the designs were done by um, a gentleman by the name of Paul Poirot, and he created this very kind of column look. We have a couple of different influences that are coming. We have this, very, this, uh, this great interest in um, Orientalism and, and people of the Orient, and look looking at kind of the bold colors and that drapey fabric that we see. And then we also have that Russian peasant costume coming in too, that kind of uh, a little bit more bohemian look, especially with the hair. There's wonderful research on the hair of this era, the beginning, you know, 1914, 1915, 1916, of this kind of wavy, kinky hair. And it, they're trying to see like how high they can get it in the back. It's not a beehive, you know, it's not straight up. It's kind of more like the bride of Frankenstein, uh, but curly and wrapped in a, a little handkerchief, or a little uh, uh, headscarf. Very, very sweet. Okay, ooh, I spelled design wrong. Sorry, ooh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, next slide, go away, go away. <laughs> So this is 1914, and you can see kind of, the, the other thing that this pattern doesn't tell you, um, and you can see it on the pattern, is there's supposed to be a belt. And so there's no piece for it or anything like that. You're just supposed to know how to make that. And so, but you can see where the waist hits is very, very uh, typical of the era. Uh, interesting that there's this dichotomy between the waist of the dress and then that kind of sack jacket. The sack jacket is actually a holdover from King Edward. King Edward was a very large man, and he didn't like the suits of the, of the time because it made him uncomfortable and it made him look even bigger than he was. And so he wore what was called a ditto suit. Suit, and it was a matching jacket and pants and vest, a three-piece suit. Um, but it was called a ditto suit back then. And he also, his jacket was not a, a form-fitting jacket. Even, uh, even like older uh, folks wear not that kind of skinny jacket, but a regular suit jacket. He always wore something that was more like a sack coat that gave him a little bit more room. Okay, next slide. 1915. We can see that there's some changes going on in regards to the waist. And of course, what's happening, it's the same thing that happens now. Everybody doesn't wear the same thing. 
Dresses don't look the same. And fashion doesn't change overnight. It's not like we go, oh, okay, I'm gonna wear these big hats and long gloves and things like that, and then I'm not gonna wear undergarments the next year. It doesn't, there's a little transition that has to happen in between there. Uh, this little lady is from, God bless you, this little lady is from around 1910 uh, to 1915. We've got a couple of, uh, of years where they're wearing similar kinds of things. What happens in this era is we have this simplicity, but we still have this high neck collar, and we're starting to get a little bit of a change. You can see with the, the layering of the skirt, we've got that kind of um, uh, orientalism that we saw in 1914 with more of a, a, a higher class look, but we've got it now kind of coming to the common people as well. Okay, next slide. 1916. Yes. And yes, and there's a dramatic difference that happens, and that's where we're going to see that, that hoop crenoline, where it kind of comes up, that war crenoline, where it comes up a little bit, and we've got this fuller skirt. We're going to go into the next era here, and so what we see is, uh, is a shorter skirt and a fuller slip underneath. Um, on this one, there's a couple of things that are going on, so I'm going to take these off so you can kind of see what's happening here. So she has, uh, i got to take all her this stuff off, sorry. I just put it all on. I got to take it all off. All right. So she has her dress, her gown, and then underneath that, she has a couple of things going on. And I'll, there's two of them, two of the four that she would be wearing are under this dress. So she's got a slip on. And I know, isn't this sweet? She has a slip on. And well, you guys are easy. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, and then she's got a set of drawers on underneath. There are a couple of different, I know I had to put a pin in here because she's too tiny. Um, I had to put a pin in here and keep these up. But this is a, a set of drawers. And there were a couple of different sets of drawers that women would wear. They would wear these that were a little bit fuller on the bottom. And then they would wear some that, had, that were a little bit narrower. They also might wear something that was known as a combination suit, which had uh, a top and a bottom, and they were joined together. If they just wore the drawers, then they would have on a little camisole on the top. Okay, so that's one, two. Over that, they would have their corset, three, and then they'd have their slip, four, and then they put on their dress, five. Oh, and they have stockings on, six. Okay, and shoes. And, uh, and I think it's really interesting, you know, when we look at this and when you look at photographs, I mean, or, 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 uh, or prints from this era, you know, there are all these kinds of dresses that we could make if only we could buy that dress for 1750, right? We would all have one. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but what, you're, what you see, though, is, uh, is people trying to be a little bit more fashionable. I don't know how this would really play out here on the prairie. It seems a little impractical. This seems a little bit more practical than wearing something like that. But you know, no matter what time of year, this is, this, these are the components of your dress for sure. Uh, and then you have to be aware, when I, when I first made this, uh, because it's, it's the same size, but the, the slip was way too long, uh, too much longer for the dress. So I had to shorten it up a little bit. Um, but then she would get dressed for the day and again, this one, this dress closes at the bottom and goes in here. Good heavens. I need a handmaiden, right? There we go. Right? Yeah. Oh, the days, huh? But also, you have to think about, like, dresses like this um, and dresses like this. These women, you know, they weren't, they weren't doing stuff like, like we, they just didn't do that kind of stuff. You know, a lot of them had, uh, they didn't have jobs. Uh, they weren't driving the kids to school and stuff. They didn't do that kind of stuff, you know. They weren't going to Walmart to get toilet paper, you know. <laughs> they didn't have to do that kind of stuff. Um, there. Okay, next slide. 1917. Okay, and then 
we start to get into uh, things that might look a little similar to the, you know, like uh, older women of the 1920s. I mean, this is very similar to women of the late teens, early 1920s. This is more of a young girl's uh, dress. This is from 1917. And so uh, whenever I think of, of dresses like this and costumes like this, um, I always think of the Triangle Factory Fire. Uh, the Triangle Factory Fire happened in New York and it was, uh, it was a group of mostly young women, uh, immigrant workers, who worked at the Triangle Factory and it caught fire and the exits were blocked and, or locked and they couldn't get out and women were jumping to their deaths because it was either that or burn. Um, and a lot of them were wearing similar things to this. You can see this is the, the dress form is a little bit low to the ground, but this is also uh, above the ankle, what hit above the ankle. Most of these patterns, because we're in such a transitional time as far as fashion goes, most of these patterns uh, are actually giving you an option. Do you want it to be a, uh, a full length? Do you want it to be a, a skimming length where it would skim the top of your shoes? Where do you want it to, to fall? This shirt also had a whole bunch of different options. It had an option for, uh, different options for the sleeve. You can have short sleeves on this one. You can have short sleeves on this one too. And you can take a look at these patterns, uh, different kinds, kinds of necklines. This collar and this collar are very, this is a pieced collar that goes on here. And actually, this is a band. This is not the collar of the shirt. This band would have a button in the back, and you would make a collar that would fit on top of this, and you would button it to it. And then you could wash your shirt, and you could change your collars. And it would look like you have all these different shirts, but really, you're just changing the collars of your shirts. This collar is more like a contemporary dress shirt that we see today, a button-down dress shirt. And then the, sl the skirt itself uh, has this kind it's very complex. I mean, it kind of reminds me of uh, the dresses from like the 1930s that are all bias cut and they're so difficult to put together. But this skirt opens on the side here and then the pocket, it's just this pocket. And of course, there's no lining, you know, there's nothing going on where this one has stuff going on underneath here, underneath here and then this one does as well. And of course, the reason that this is muslin or, or a cotton, a cheaper cotton, is because you don't see it. I'm not gonna waste a whole bunch of really nice uh, fabric on something you're not even going to see. And so when I got, with, the, with this pattern piece, with the under, uh, under piece here, it, you make it out of this, and then there's a line on it where you're gonna put that fancy fabric on there, and that's all we're going to see. This one too, there's so much of it that we don't see that we're not gonna waste that expensive striped fabric on there. We're just gonna cover it up. And then this one doesn't have anything like that at all. It is just a skirt. But the closure is really, really interesting and very complicated. Uh, the patterning calls for these extra buttons on the side, but they're non-functioning. It closes at the top here and then has this kind of basic uh, um, shirt, that go, the blouse that goes along with it. And then the backing is just gathered like so. But there are a couple of options too. You can wear them. This one you can wear on the inside or the outside of the skirt as well. So they're doing a little bit of, tra there's a little bit of transition going on. Okay, the next one. And the next one. Okay, so now we get to the end of the war and we really start to see um, a more comfortableness in the, in the garments. What's happened, of course, is some of the women are working now. Uh, they're not in the homes, and so they want something that's going to be comfortable. This also is much, much more typical to what we're going to see uh, women wearing, you know, when they're what we think of, you know, baking bread and things like this. This woman is not a baking bread kind of lady, right? She's got this really nice fabric on, and she's uh, lounging and being beautiful. That's her job. This has a couple of uh, components to it as well. This sash, which again, you know, it doesn't have a pattern piece for because you could just be able to figure out what, what that is or how wide you want it and things like that. And then it hooks on the side here. And then this fichu just comes off and then you have a different dress. And then it buttons up the back. With these sweet little buttons up the back. But this one, and it looks like it's just kind of a basic uh, day dress. But when you look at it, this front panel here is incredibly long. You turn up all of the pieces of the garment, and then you make these little tucks 
like that. So this is the one level here. There's another level there and another there. And there's the, there's the third one right there. And so when you cut it out, you have this huge piece of fabric and then you just kind of tuck it all up. The same thing is done with the sleeves. All of these garments have, I think it's in this one, inside of them have um, a belt. And so like the blouses all have little belts inside of them to keep this shape so that when, if your shirt were to come untucked for some reason, I mean, they can attach it to the waistband. But if it were to come untucked, it would hold the shape. It wouldn't like blouse out because it's all contained together. Um, also the patterns, uh, these, this pattern and this pattern, I think too, uh, they have uh, instructions on whether or not you want it to be a skirt and a top, or if you want it to be a dress. You can make them one, one piece or two pieces, depending on what you want. So um, really, really interesting. And then these, just, these elements just kind of whoops, uh, go back on, and then the belt secures them in place. She's very sweet. I, just, I think it sounds very sweet. It looks, looks super comfortable. And then the final one from the era, you know, as far as World War I goes, is this uh, brown polyester. And it called for a different kind of fabric, but it's similar to polyester, so I just use that instead. And then that comes with, there's three pieces to that, and it's got uh, this jacket on the top. And a belt. And then this is a little dress that goes underneath it here. But this one, what's happening is you can see how slim the skirts are getting. I mean, two years ago, we had that crinoline underneath those, those dresses that were kind of making those dresses poof out. Even this one has a, a, a big slip under it with a lot of uh, crinoline to make it push, up, push out a little bit. And this one is very sleek. And then, two years later, we get the things on either side, which are um, basically a column and that flapper dress with minimal undergarments as well. Um, before, I should have said this before, uh, this dress actually is the only dress that I have in stock that's similar to these dresses from this era, but you can see what's happened. Uh, time and weather and all those kinds of things have really taken a toll on it. But the pieces are here, the components are here. Um, also, when you look at these dresses, the construction of how they close is really difficult. I mean, for, for me, it was, it was really difficult to understand. I'm used to zippers and snaps and hooks and things like that. And when you're getting things that have to lay over things or they crisscross, like this one, you can see when she, this is attached here and then the piece is freestanding and it comes up and it wraps around this shoulder to duplicate the right side and then in the back it has to come over here and crisscross and duplicate the back as well. And so the fit of these garments was really, uh, really intricate and so when we're looking at, and it says, it does say in the patterns, it does say uh, fit. So you make all these things and it says fit. You have to fit it on the person so that it really uh, looks decent on them and it doesn't look like it's uh, bulging or gathering or whatever where it's not supposed to. Uh, okay, next slide. And next slide. Yeah, so this is, then this is two years after the war. And again, we've gone from 1912, two years before the war, to 1920, two years after the war. And so what we see here is that flapper era. And things are very different. We don't have the long skirts anymore. They are, uh, they are above the, the ankle. They're almost to the calf. They're much more free flowing than they were. And even though we have this structure, this corset structure, things are also changing with the corset. Uh, there are women who are going to get rid of the corset completely when we get into that flapper era. We also start to get different things in the corsets as well. Um, if any of you know what a girdle looks like, those kind of stretch panels, we start to get stretch panels in here as opposed to cotille, which is, it doesn't stretch and doesn't it holds you in as much. It gives you a little bit more breathability. Um, and so things are starting to change that way too. Um, also, as you can see, even from a couple of the fabrics that I have here, 
uh, this pink um, sequined one over here, and then the green and brown one. You would wear a slip under this. It's not, this is not the whole dress. Um, uh, hopefully not. But you can see that the dresses are so sheer to wear undergarments is kind of impeding some of what the dress looks like. We've got a couple of different um, items here as well. I don't have um, dress forms for all of them, but you can surely come and take a look at them. They are elements that are from SMSU's stock, and so I brought them in because otherwise they just sit in a bin, and you should be able to touch them. You know, I mean, we're not a museum where you can't touch anything. I mean, you really should be able to touch this stuff. Uh, some of it is falling apart. The dresses from this era, as you can see from the one that we have over on your far left there, and then the pink one next to it, they just, the actual dresses from the era are very difficult to maintain. They just don't hold up very well uh, <clears throat> because the threads wear after a while and the fabrics wear after a while. I mean, of course, we do have examples of these um, in different museums and things like that, but just to have them. We got a donation last year, and it was somebody whose you know, grandmother had had them, and they're, they're in rough shape. They're in rough shape. The fabric is just kind of disintegrating. And you can see from this, too, what's happening is all of the threads are breaking apart. And this is due mostly to the weight of the sequins. They're just tearing the, the, breaking the threads apart. And you can see also in the New Idea Quarterly, you may or may not know this, but you can see the young girl on the top there. It was typical for a long time for children to dress like their parents and like the adults. And so you would see these young girls wearing dresses similar to this, but in a miniature size, uh, which was really, really interesting. And that changes when we start to get into the 1920s as well, and we really start to get teenagers who kind of uh, become their own group uh, of, uh, of buyers. <clears throat> okay, next one. Yeah, and those are just some of the sources. A couple of, uh, of websites that I found that have really good images of different kinds of dresses from this era. And what I really wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that you have enough time to take a look at them and take them apart. You really should take them apart and, and, and see how they go together. Um, these are all the, uh, the brown and pink one, and then all of them to here, and the corset are all complete. Uh, this one, is, of course, is just in stages. So you can take them apart and take a look at them. Uh, there's corset in the corset here. There's boning on the inside, and the busk just clips open like that. And then on the inside, we have uh, stay casings, and this is how they would have made their corsets as well. They ha we have stay casings here. And then there's a steel um, stay in there. Their stays would have been made of whalebone. We're a little nicer to the whales now. We don't do that anymore. Um, but they would have been made of whalebone. And then these actually don't even have very many stays on them. There are a few of them here. Uh, maybe 10, 20 years before this, this would have been encased in stays and trying to manipulate that shape. And not just here, but adding it to the bust as well to make sure that you get the right shape for all of your dresses. Again, of just a few years prior to this, we also have the big hoops, we have the big bustles. So women have these contraptions on that make, that make their dresses stick out in the back, and then they have, you know, we're like weighted down with fabric and stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> and so things have changed a lot in the beginning of the 20th century, and then as we go through the Great War, it just becomes even more so. And as we emerge from the Great War, women have, start to have a voice, they start, to, um, they start to work outside of the home, and they need to have garments that are much more functional for lots of different kinds of things than just, just housework or entertaining. And so we see that as we get into the end of the era here. We've got this, um, this fabric that's a little bit more wearable, a little bit more durable, and it just moves a little bit better than something that's so constricting as, uh, as some of those earlier garments. One of the things that I didn't bring was, uh, was some shoes. We don't have a whole lot of shoes from this era, but depending on what you, the outfit that you're wearing, you're probably going to be wearing boots, um, ankle, or a little bit higher than your ankle boots, and they're probably going to be duo colored, like a brown and a black, or a gray and a black, and they'll button up the side. We have fake replicas of them now that zip, right? <laughs> they didn't have zippers. Um, they would do, use a little hook and, and, and um, pull their button through. And then as we get to the end of the era, then we start to get um, kid leather pumps, uh, little white kid leather pumps, which are made of, uh, of goats. Yeah, I know, I know, you're welcome. <laughs> And so when you see those little white shoes that have the little heel and then they have a little strap and the little pointy toe, those are called kid, kid leather and they're made out of uh, goat skin. So, 
So that's the, that's the presentation and that's the dresses. But I, like I said, I really do want you to come up and kind of touch them and look at them. Does anybody have any, yeah? Did men just do the designing? Were there women designers in that era? You know, <clears throat> when you look at the, the things that are here, um, Paul Perot was a, a haute couture designer, like a high fashion designer. So some of that stuff is impractical. Um, as far as women design, Coco Chanel um, is designing in the late 19 teens. Um, but we, you know, the, the male isn't anything like we see now, you know. So when you see fashion magazines and, magazines and things like that, that's one of the reasons that the fashion doesn't change very quickly because the news doesn't travel very quickly. So what's hot in Paris doesn't get here. I think it's coming soon, like a couple, a couple of years, you know, from 1914, it'll be here finally kind of thing. Um, but, <clears throat> so, but I don't know about the women of the, I mean, Coco Chanel, I do know that she was designing. Um, and then we have people like um, the Ballet Ruse is happening in the 1920s and things like that in Paris, late 19 teens. Um, and we have people that are designing. Erte was a fashion designer at that time too, but a lot of it was impractical. It was that high fashion stuff that you, you would wear on the runway kind of thing, but it's nothing that you would actually wear out. So what out. is the general size that you find out when you look at that? That's kind of the common size. Yeah, the these, are, these are all, the, I mean, these are like average size. This, this is a gigant. I mean, when I saw it at first, I thought, 44, really? And actually, this dress form is too small, which never happens. I mean, usually they're too big. Um, but usually they're tiny. I mean, it's, it's like this. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Would they modify these for maternity? <clears throat> yeah, oh, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, they did. And some of them actually talk a little bit about that. Even the corset was modified for maternity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, modified for maternity. So you would wear it as long as you could. And then when you couldn't wait, really wear a corset anymore because it wasn't healthy, then you would be confined to the home. Because we don't want to be looking at that, apparently. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they and they could. And actually, one of the first years that we were in Marshall, there was they were cleaning out. There was somebody in uh, in Ghent who had she had passed away, and she had a, a, an amazing collection of clothes. And they were going through her stuff, and a family was, and they were trying to get it ready for like some kind of show about because she'd had all this she'd kind of been kind of a clothes horse, and she had like her mother's clothes and things like that. And so they asked me to come out and date some of them. And there was this one thing, I, I couldn't figure out what, I didn't understand what it was. I didn't understand the construction. It looked like it had been taken apart and put together, which isn't uncommon. I mean, if, you know, your sister moves away and you have her, she, you know, she gets married and then you have little ones, you just kind of keep modifying until the fabric isn't any good anymore. But this one was really a puzzle because it really did look like it was worn by the same person. And because um, it wasn't shortened or anything like that. And as I looked at it, I realized it had been taken out and put together after she had had babies. So she let it out when she got too big, and then she took it back in, and she lost the weight, and then kept going on like that with the fabric. Yeah, one of, a, one of the guys that I worked with was just telling me about this, um, this preacher that he knew that um, his wife would, when he, out, when he wore out his suits, she would take them and she would flip them so that he could wear the inside on the outside of the garment. And then when that wore out, she cut apart the whole thing and she made a suit for herself. That's amazing seamstress work. Yeah, yeah. But you don't waste anything, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? So with the fashion, most of these dresses, were they made by women themselves? Yeah. So they, get, they get the pattern. Yeah, and yep. And then they make, and then everybody has, it wouldn't be all uniform. Right. And Sears Roebuck, you know, Sears Roebuck had catalogs that they were sending out and you could get things, but you had the skill to make it. And it's, it's similar today. You know, if you sew a lot and you make things for yourself, you might as well just make it instead of trying, you know, buying it. It's a lot cheaper to do that. Usually it's, it's less expensive. And then you get what you want. You can buy the fabric that you want and things like that. And they were skilled at doing this. They knew how to sew. It wasn't like they needed a new dress and they had to figure out a pattern because they knew how to do it. They knew how all the components went together. Yeah, but they would get the sewing machine for it. The, uh, you know, the pedal one. My grandmother had one. You know, where the, where the oh yeah, the trottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And see, that's what the girls. You know, the girls at the Triangle Factory fire, or the Triangle Factory. That's what they were sewing on. Were those those yeah. push? Um, with the, 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 yeah, they're kind of like a big rectangle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of work. 
you know, but they, again, uh, I'm not say, and I'm not saying it like, oh, but they didn't do anything else, but they didn't have a job outside the home. I mean, they took care of the home, and then part of that job was to, yeah, was to sew. Mm -hmm. Wash day, sewing day, all, you know, that kind of but thing. But they also didn't have that clothes. My mother said she right. had three dresses when, right. when she was young. One for, one for Sunday for mm -hmm. good, and then two for every day. Mm -hmm. so she'd wash one and mm -hmm. wear the other, and that mm -hmm. was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and my, you know, my grandmother wore a girdle until the day she died. Mm -hmm. Until the day she died in the mid-80s. You know, that's what, yeah, I think that that's true. I mean, we think, we think about, like, oh, they must have had tons of skirts and tons. They didn't have that kind of, they didn't. Right. Oh, I should have made some aprons. Oh, that would have been good. Yeah. Oh, that's another presentation. We could do historical aprons. Oh, ooh, that would be fun. That would be fun. Any other questions? what was the rule of synthetics? Were there any during the war? Because the Germans were obviously not making much of the synthetic model. You know, I don't know any I don't know about that at all. In World War II that becomes a huge deal because women aren't wearing nylons and we have to shorten the skirts because they're too long and that's really wasteful. I don't know about World War One. I. I don't know about I didn't read anything about that. Background some of those other synthetic fibers. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, most of the stuff, you know, is cotton right. and wool, right? I mean, this is wool. So I don't know how much they would even have been affected by that. Mm -hmm. And again, the information to get out to people would take so long. I mean, and we weren't in the war that long. You know, what, a, a year and a half? Not even a year and a half, right? Yeah. In Europe, weren't they using parachute fabric a lot for making um, clothing as well? Yeah, and surely with stuff like, you know, these things that you don't even see, why wouldn't you? Why would you waste good fabric and things like that? I mean, we didn't, you know, when my grandmother was young, she said they never, when they butchered a pig, the only thing that they got rid of was the oink. They, they ate everything, you know. And it's the same kind of thing. If you have it and you don't use it anymore for what it's used for, then you got to repurpose it. I mean, we do that in the theater all the time. I and mean, most, some of the stuff that you see up here is stuff that we've had to rethink how to do it because... You know, the stuff is too expensive or whatever, or we don't want to throw it away. So how else do we use it? Yeah. I think it also, like, the fact that some of these older pieces aren't holding up, I wonder how much of that is because you only have the one or the two. Whereas totally. We can just go to, to Walmart or Shopko or go online or whatever and order five. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and I mean, this dress, I mean, this was a really nice dress in its day. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful things going on with it. There's some, uh, some tucking going on, and then you can see that the way it's stitched together, it's really fitted to her body, but it's been taken, oh, this is a cording in here, um, to fit her waist. And this beautiful drape in the back, and then this coming over with the frog closure over here to hook on. But, I mean, she's not going to wear this every day. You know, this is a special a very special kind of dress. I mean, this is, this is some of the span of Downton Abbey, but what you see up here is really like a lower class. I mean, this would probably be worn by them, and maybe this, but most of this wouldn't be worn by them because that's, you know, they're not that class of people. And the servants, of course, are, but we don't see them, and mostly don't see them in their uh, daily wear. We see them in their uniforms. Yeah. Sure, that was actually a question I had, was the difference between the prints and, and you know, the, uh, market that they're catering to and, and you know, was there a huge difference between what more wealthy people were wearing? Totally. totally. Totally different, totally different. Because for one thing, they're not making they're not making right. their garments. These people are making their own garments. Right. Uh, they also probably have dressmakers, hat makers, shoemakers. So they would go in and they could order whatever they so wanted. Class. Those prints, especially like the Poirot, I mean, those are geared towards people that had those money. Right. Because what happens, what, what we don't see here, I mean, these people are, uh, they're more, you know, of us, right? I mean, they, they kind of go to church on Sundays and they gather for meetings, you know, at families' homes and things like that. The elite are having balls and parties and things like that that they really need to dress up for. So they'll have these turban headdresses and things like that. And you know, if you watch Downton Abbey at all, there's a, a scene, a very you know, powerful, important scene where Sybil comes in and she's wearing pants. 
she's wearing pants. Um, and we see pants because women are in the workforce, so they're, you know, they're wearing pants during the war. But to just wear pants, I mean, we're all wearing pants, you know, right? Uh, that would be unheard of. That would be absolutely unheard of. And, and even the, the pair that she's wearing in Downton Abbey, it's for a very specific kind of event. It's not like, um, not like she's just wearing them. To, you know, they're not blue jeans. Um, but by the end of the show, we see Edith in them often because she's riding a bike and she's not wearing a, a skirt, which she would have. Uh, you know, earlier on, she would have been wearing a skirt and cycling. And now she's wearing pants. Kind of along with Downton mentioning it, it's like um, when Matthew's, I think his coat or something ends up getting burned or a tear. He can't do anything about it. It's got to be handed to his, his ballot. Right. And they've got to hand it to London. And it's got all this stuff just to fix yeah, and there's there's lots of scenes if you watch the show at all. There's a lot of scenes where Anna's sitting at that big table and she's sewing stuff for people upstairs. She's mending their things and things like that for sure. Yeah. Any other questions about anything? Take a look at this stuff and take it apart. Uh, this uh, this little garment here has uh, doesn't have an actual waistband on it. It has what, can, what comes to be known in the 1930s as a Hollywood waist, which means it doesn't have a waistband on it. And we still have pants like this today. Every once in a while you'll see people wearing pants like this. But it's got this band around the top to keep its shape, and then it closes, and then there's no closures here, as far as the pattern says, um, until the button's down here. But then when you take it, when you unbutton it, there's this little um, opening inside here, and so you can close it, you know, you can close it and then bring it together like so. But it's all, yeah, yeah there it is. On that corset, would they wear some muslin underneath that? Yeah, they would, it, with the drawers that, that I showed you? Yeah, yep. right yep, they would wear, but they didn't have a bra, they didn't wear a bra. No, no, no. They, had, they had the drawers on and then a camisole, and then they put that over the camisole, or, either, or they, if they were attached, they're called a combination. And it's the drawers and the camisole together, connected. And then they would wear that over it. Yeah. And I think, you know, we think of the, all the stuff fitting really well and, and them looking great all the time. If they're standing still, they look great. You know, but if they move, gravity takes over and things like that. So, and oftentimes, what you can see, like, with this, with this corset and with this camisole up here, you know, it's, all, it's being worn under something like this. So there's all, it's like wearing a t-shirt all the time, you know, on your stuff. So it's, you have to kind of be aware um, of that. And of course you can't see it. That's why a lot of the, the necklines are high too. And then when we get rid of that, then we can see it opening up a little bit, you know, or part of that camisole just gets a little lower so we can see that. I know the underwear didn't have elastic, it was tied on. Right, yeah, this, is, this has a My little hook on it, yeah. He, when he was young in the 30s probably, they were at a dance and at the end of the dance, somebody's bloom was for I wouldn't think so. <laughs> just better, just better, right, yeah, yeah. Well, and the stockings too, you know, the sto these suspenders are actually short. The real suspenders would have been quite lengthy. These were actually, this is one of those repurposed things. We did a show a couple of years ago and she had to have um, garters on and uh, she had a little corset, a corset tee kind of uh, piece on, but we didn't have any kind of gar uh, garment, uh, corset, um, suspend sorry, car corset suspenders like this. So we took the things that you hold your mattress pad on. <laughs> we, just cut the, we just cut the end off them and they work. So uh, that's all right. And they have the little piece here for the stocking and everything. But these would actually, this corset would have sat about here and then the, the suspenders would have come down to here and then the stockings. They don't, they don't come all the way up to the thigh. They're just kind of just above the when knee. When I was in, I grew up as a little girl in the 50s and we had garters that were always in a tangle. Oh. We had, we wore white for church and we wore brown stockings during the year, during the weekdays mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. we went to school. But it was a whole harness that you wore, not just around your waist. It went around your shoulders too. I remember trying to unwrap, you know, get. Oh, sure, because the strings, well, or the straps, all twist around. around mm -hmm. each other. Sure, 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 sure. Wow. Yeah, beauty is pain. You know, it takes a lot to look so good, right? Um, and then, and then as we get to, you can see that it's starting here. You know, these are all closing in the front. This one's a little bit on the side. But as we get to the end of the era, and then when we go into the 1930s, all the dresses are closing on the left side. They all close on the left side. Uh, this dress does. Uh, this one does as well. This actually has a whole opening on the side. 
that gets unhooked and then the piece comes off like so. Uh, and that will happen in the 1930s, 1940s, and then the 1950s things start to change again. The other thing that was very difficult when we were dealing with these patterns, and again, I brought some uh, contemporary patterns for you to look at, but the, um, the symbols change, and they changed in this era. So when we sew with contemporary patterns now, um, all of the sleeves and all the pattern pieces have little notches, little V's on them, and you cut them out so you know where the pieces are supposed to go together. And so all of the sleeves have a one notch in the front and two notches in the back, right? No, nope. no, nope. these add two, mat two notches in the front and one notch in the back. And you'll notice, if you look, this sleeve is on backwards. Because <laughs> I'm like, I know how to put the sleeve on, it's going the wrong way. So uh, yeah, it was, it was it, it's funny now, I guess, I don't know. Uh, maybe tomorrow it'll be funny. But then, but then as, we, as I was doing these, and I didn't do them in order, I kind of did them, like I did the skirts you know, together and I did the tops together and things like that. But then I noticed as we get to the end of the era here, um, we go from one notch in the back and then it's in the front and then it's in the back again. It's like they couldn't even decide how the patterns were going, going to go. And now it's kind of standardized that the, the two notches are in the front. So there's some transition going on with a lot of different kinds of things. Um, also, and you can look at the patterns, you can come up and look at the patterns, but there's very little information. And in the, in the packet when I got them, she pointed this out, but there's a lot of information about what the garment looks like, but not how to make it. A lot of information. So if you want to know what it's supposed to look like when you're done, but how much you failed, you know, you can just read, you know, you can just read that. Um, we really, it was an interesting project to do because we kind of just do what we do all the time. We don't even think about it. So this really made me step back and go, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that goes together. So, um, and these will all go into our stock because I got that grant, you know, from the university. So it's basically university money. So these will all go back into stock. And so maybe in a year or two, if we do a show, I'll, I'll have some things that I can actually pull. This is really, I just, this is my favorite one. I think it's so beautiful. And it's fun to see people coming in the shop and they're, oh, I love that one. Oh, I love that one. Oh, I love that one, you know. So very fun. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, this, yeah, this, you know, there was something, somebody gave me a little cartoon about it, and it was during World War II um, that we didn't, you know, we didn't see it in fashion for a while, um, and we have a couple of those things that are happening during World War, you know, the release of the nylons, we don't have nylons, we can't use that, um, but then I, th I want to say, I can't remember the year, but it was sometime during, like just before or during World War II that, that we get the zipper, but in clothing we don't, we don't really see it until uh, dungarees. Blue jeans are the first thing that get zippers. Mm -hmm. And they did some innovative things, you know, um, and this is way off topic, but Edith Head was uh, a costume designer in Hollywood in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s. Um, and she, she was very clever, and she never really dressed up when she was at work because it, it was always muted suits because she was always with the starlets who wanted to be the, the center of attention. But when she was away from work, she would do these kind of clever things with fabric and, and fashion and stuff. And she had this one shirt that was printed with safety pins, and then all of the buttons on the front were actually safety pins. They were actual safety pins. You know, very cute, kind of fun. Uh, thinking outside the box a little bit with the fashion. Yeah. Any other questions? Come and take a look. Come and take a look. Thank you.